Well, hey, thanks for uh, for asking for hosting. Yeah. So yeah, well, welcome everyone uh, in the School of Music and uh, Creative Media Production. I'm really happy to host uh, Eric and uh, Emily uh, from Space Base, and uh, open over. So. Okay. Thank you. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, uh, one is one thing to note is this uh, funny little Bitly address here, which has uh, has a low resolution version of my slides and also uh, some links uh, to videos and things like that. Um, so maybe I should kind of write it over here. It's a uh, the the case matters, so it's. Uh, Space Base, which is a uh, it's a project to uh, develop uh, uh, entrepreneurial and space uh, communities around the world, you know, starting in New Zealand. And so uh, we're here on, as part of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship for three years, and our project is to encourage people to uh, learn about space in New Zealand and be involved with. Uh, Developing space projects. Uh, <coughs> so my background is I uh, started in physics and then uh, astronomy and mapping the galaxy and then uh, went into space engineering. And what I'm going to talk to you about is I worked eight years on space station design for uh, for NASA as a, uh, a contractor. This is uh, just an overview of what. Uh, that before you get um, get a, a spacecraft like uh, the lunar module on the moon, you go through a process of concept conceptual design. And so this little cute little thing was the original concept of a lunar module. Uh, and this is uh, John Holt Hubolt, uh, who developed the concept of rendezvousing in, in lunar orbit. So this all happened 55 years ago. Uh, and what I'm talking to talk to you about is almost as old uh, about 30 years ago when I was working on the conceptual design of the space station. Um, let me move this a little bit. Uh, so I worked on uh, NASA Langley's office, the space station office, uh, and we had the role of, of developing the future of uh, how to grow a space station to support missions to the moon and Mars, uh, and also worked on uh, the as a technical assessment office so that we, uh, our office could assess anything related to the space station design and report to NASA headquarters on that. And we had 50 engineers specializing in different subsystems. I was lucky enough to have an open charter to look at any subsystem. Uh, and so I worked on unit accommodations, communication, power, module arrangement, uh, and also the early interface with the Russian systems. So uh, part of this, uh, the reason why I'm talking about this is that uh, this, you know, it seems like ancient history, but it's uh, becoming relevant again because we're about to enter a big burst of activity of designing new habitats in space. Uh, missions, big missions to the moon and Mars are being planned. And so there's, uh, a new opportunity, uh, once again, to look at space architecture and space design. Uh, one, one area that I worked on was early conceptual design of the docking tunnel between the U.S. and Russian systems. And uh, uh, so I feel ownership for this little tunnel. <laughs> Whenever I see it, like in the movie Gravity, it's like, oh, there's my tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is a confusing chart uh, uh, tracking the history of some of the private space, uh, space flight. Uh, my wife, uh, Emily, worked on for Space Adventures and helped send uh, five of the uh, seven private space flight participants to the space station. Um, all you need to 
if you want to go to the space station, is uh, to train in Russia for six months in Russian and uh, spend $50 million. And you get uh, 10 days in space. Uh, so we're, we're big believers that this is going to change dramatically, that it's going to be a lot cheaper to go into space pretty soon. Uh, and part of the reason is that we're now getting to the point where we're not throwing away the rockets. Uh, Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy are, are landing parts of the rocket and reusing them. And just imagine how many times you'd fly on an airplane if you had to throw away the airplane after each flight. And that's about based on what you do with, because uh, the rockets like the Soyuz model, um, the Soyuz is about similar to building a, a new airliner each time and uh, in terms of cost and they and it's thrown away after one flight. So there's there's some ideas that uh, uh, SpaceX uh, thinks that they can get their vehicle that can carry a hundred people down to uh, seven million dollars a flight which is starting to be in the range of uh, a cruise ship ticket. So another big surprise was that orbital tourism happened before suborbital. Uh, suborbital uh, vehicles should be flying maybe next year uh, and carrying passengers uh, after, soon after that. So this is, these are some of the topics I wanted to talk about today. Uh, some of the design factors, uh, some of the alternative designs in the history of, from space station design. Uh, future designs in Earth orbit, and then uh, habitats on the moon, Mars, asteroids, and what is happening in the near future. So and just as an exercise for the design factors, I'll just spend a couple minutes on this. But um, if you have a, here you have a Earth and, uh, and some like uh, space station here, what kind of factors can you think of that you have to worry about or think about uh, when when you are working on a design of a space station. Uh, uh, you know, like, uh, well, there's a vacuum on here and you have to have a pressurized, uh, but it's not that different from an airliner. Airliner, uh, an aircraft high altitude um, is dealing with a third of an atmosphere pressure difference. This is just one atmosphere pressure difference. It's, it's not as hard as submarines or anything like that. Uh, uh, 40 atmospheres or something. Anyone else? Uh, anyone have a yeah. extra radiation? Yeah, radiation. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, if you have um, in Earth orbit, yeah, you have some radiation. You're you're still protected by magnetic fields of the Earth in low Earth orbit. Uh, if you go out to the Moon or Mars, you have uh, a bigger factor concerned with radiation. Uh, and there's one area around South America that you actually get extra radiation just because the magnetic field of the Earth dips in a little bit. Impact. Uh, impact. Yeah, impact of, of um, there's uh, uh, orbital debris and there's also micrometeorites. And uh, the way that the shielding is done is um, actually a little plate is put out about uh, 15 centimeters out so that if you if a small object hits, it vaporizes and then spreads the uh, impact over a large area. Uh, but anything larger than a marble can really punch right through the uh, to the space station. So it's always a concern, um, and uh, it's also a concern for astronauts going on spacewalks because the even paint flakes can go right through the suit. So I'm always worried that we're going to hear about some astronaut on a spa spacewalk getting. Uh, puncture. Any yeah, other? Yeah, heat. 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 Yes. Um, uh, in, on Earth, all our electronics are uh, uh, cooled by air and convection. Uh, and and uh, uh, on space, you, you get something really hot and it just can't cool itself down. So you have to uh, build on uh, a cooling system like often uh, a liquid that will flow through and go out to our radiator and the heat is, is radiated away to space. And so uh, uh, thermal control on space spacecraft is always a big issue. 
Any other uh, parameter you can think of? Humans. Humans, like you know, keeping. Uh, uh, yeah, everything for the people on board. Um, the life support system is designed for you know how long you're there and how many people are there. Um, like for example, the, the space station is designed for six people, and uh, but it can have visitors. Like a, when a shuttle would visit, they sometimes have ten or thirteen people on board, and they had to really be aware of how many days can they stay and that the life support can support them. Uh, and so uh, uh, they, it's a, that's the biggest driver on, on space station design is how many people uh, are you designing for? And um, so far everybody has been designing for just a handful of people, but we're getting to the point where the next phase of design is for hundreds of people to be on orbit for one time. Gravity, the lack of gravity. Yeah, lack of gravity, microgravity. Um, there's a, uh, uh, the researchers, I mean, that's a big part of why the space station was, was built, was to, to have uh, zero gravity in the, in the labs. Um, if you wanted to stay long term, uh, a lot of people, you know, that's why you have rotating uh, space stations where, where you're, you're standing on the inside as it, as it spins around. No one has ever built one of these things. It's a, uh, that's probably the next kind of phase of, of space station design, is to build rotating ones. Or, or also you can do, you can just have two um, pieces, you know, rotating around with a tether hanging, holding them together. Uh, no one knows how much uh, artificial gravity is gonna be good for the long term. Uh, but the uh, microgravity is, is a huge design factor. Um, one thing it, it helps with is the uh, moving equipment around. And so if you have these half ton racks uh, that you push around, it's, it's very easy to float them down through the inside of the space station and put them in place. Uh, uh, you just, they will crush you if, they, if you <laughs> drive them into the wall. But, uh, if you're careful with it, you can actually float these things around very well. But that does mean that each of the astronauts has to exercise about two hours each day just to keep their muscles from atrophying. And they still have long-term effects with the uh, loss of bone mass. What about moisture okay. and uh, yeah. things like that? Moisture, yeah, there's, um, uh, the atmosphere can get really, uh, really high moisture. They, they have all these scrubbers. Uh, lots of fans because the air doesn't move naturally. You have to push the air around. Um, they actually have instituted in the last few years a recycling, a complete uh, water recycling system. So every everything, all the moisture on the walls, all the, in fact, all the urine gets coming into the uh, water processor, and you drink it again. <laughs> so that's uh, that's one thing to think about when you go visit the space station. Drag and the need to maneuver. Yeah, the drag. Um, because the uh, the space station doesn't uh, isn't put really high altitude because of the radiation belts. Uh, we're going to avoid that, and also want to be able to lift things uh, with the rockets easier. If you you uh, if you're flying around 400 kilometers, um, it will uh, drag down in in two years. If you don't do anything, it'll come re-enter the atmosphere in two years. And so you have to keep on, uh, uh, when there's a, just an upper, just a little slight uh, uh, drag of the upper atmosphere, means that you have to keep reboosting the station. And so one person, I mean, one, one of the early internal NASA justifications for the space station was, boy, once we launch it, Congress will never cut us because, well, we're going to have to be juggling this. We'll always have to be sending missions up and always uh, keeping it in orbit, or else it's, you throw away $150 billion. Uh, and uh, luckily, we're partners with the Russians, because we don't have any way to, to, to boost it right now. The Russians do. <laughs> so they're, they're keeping it up for us. So anyway, those are just a few of the, uh, some of the parameters that you end up uh, considering. And here's, here's some of the other ones. Um, and so, uh, 
Yeah, orbital inclination is the angle that the orbit makes with respect to the, the equator. Um, it's, uh, Space Station Freedom was designed to be the easiest to get to from Florida, so it was due east from Florida, which is 28 and a half degrees inclination. But then with the, bringing the Russians in as partners, we moved it to uh, 52 degrees inclination. And that means that it's, uh, uh, it goes far north and far south, and so it actually, um, at 7.33 tonight, it will be over our overhead down here. And, uh, and also, it's, not, it's cloudy tonight, but it's, it's also, uh, it'll be visible on about the same time on Saturday, if you, if you I don't know. Have, who has seen the space station in, in the sky? Yeah. Yeah, it's very impressive. It's, uh, it, it looks as bright as Venus going across. And it looks like, uh, it looks like a high altitude airplane, except it doesn't blink, it doesn't have any blinking lights. And the reason why is that uh, it's, it's actually uh, 30 times higher than the high altitude airplane, but moving 30 times faster. So it looks like it goes across the sky about the same angle. It goes one, one side of the sky to the other in eight minutes. So some of the, uh, with all these design factors, uh, you have different solutions. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, how many minutes does it take to complete that, 16 minutes? Um, no, 90 minutes to let go around the Earth. Yeah, so an hour and a half. And so it goes around the Earth uh, 16 times a day. And so you see, if you're on the space station, you see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every day. if you have time to look out the window, which the yeah, <laughs> So here's uh, early concepts of space station with uh, carrying lots of people is the movie 2001. I don't know, who has seen the movie 2001? Yeah, okay. I like that movie. My wife hates it, anyway. <laughs> she says it's too boring. Uh, so the, the 2001 movie, Rotating Space Station, um, this also, this was actually driven by, uh, by the Von Brown's really concept of a space station. Here's his, his book from 1952. Um, and this was, he really laid out the whole, even you know, five years before Sputnik, uh, he laid out the whole uh, concept of, of uh, sending people to a spa building a space station in orbit. Here he has the, the, the shuttle and uh, a space telescope too. Uh, these are the space stations that have flown. Um, there's the, the Russians were the first with Soviet 1, and then uh, Skylab was a follow-on to the uh, Apollo program. And then the Russians, for many years, uh, the Russians were the only game in town with, with lots of uh, small space stations and building up to their, their Mir space station. Uh, and then they uh, joined uh, in a partnership to make the International Space Station. And the Chinese have launched two. They're, they're planning on their third one being the large one. Uh, the first one came in, re-entered uh, the atmosphere just uh, some um, last month or something. And this is all zoom in on the scale. So the uh, um, oops. So the on this scale, the, the oh, it's only these modules here that actually where people are inside. That's the pressurized part. All this part is out here is, is uh, external trusts and power systems and things like that. On the Russian side, it's, it's a, a lot of modules that are plugged together. The Russians like to design uh, power systems that support each module in, independently so that uh, uh, they normally, they don't have uh, general power systems across the whole system. And uh, you can see how Skylab had one wing ripped off in flight and uh, went launched and had a big dramatic rescue mission at the very start. So this is what uh, uh, General uh, Salyut uh, module, uh, Russians got a lot of experience with uh, many years of, of operating their space station. Uh, here the, they start how to dock these things, plug them together. Um, and, uh, and basically uh, learned a lot about space station operations. And the US really benefited from, 
partnering with the Russians uh, in the uh, space, International Space Station. Uh, there are a lot of things that the, that the U.S. had forgotten what, how to do. There was, uh, back in 86, this is a, a little side story, I went and proposed that the uh, U.S. shuttle visit the Mir Space Station, and I got chased around by the FBI. <laughs> that blocked my astronaut application. And then the astronauts that were selected were on a shuttle to visit the Mir Space Station. So my timing was really terrible. Um, so here's Skylab. Uh, Skylab uh, was uh, made out of the uh, upper stage of the, uh, of the Saturn V rocket, and it had this big interior here. It, was, it remains the largest uh, interior volume that's ever been flown, uh, just because the, the, the space station module itself was that big. Uh, and then they had other uh, grid-like structures, and they even had this solar telescope here. Um, there was a, uh, a, they decided to try to make it a uh, completely three-dimensional design, where you had one panel that was up right this way, another panel like this way, and one this way. And all the astronauts hated it except for one astronaut. Only one astronaut liked the 3D effect. And so at the NASA, after doing that, decided to always try to maintain an artificial vertical when inside the space station. I, I think they should try more three really crazy stuff. <laughs> Here's the, the Chinese space station look very much like the Russian ones. They've added some improvements, like after every visiting vehicle, they leave the orbital module here and grow the station that way. Uh, but it, you can, this looks almost exactly like a Russian station interior. Then there were, the, then back in the 80s, there were started to be these concepts of what to design a, a, a space station. Um, Houston uh, had the Space Operations Center. You can see these, these attachments to these modules on every, every module. Uh, Langley had a power tower, which was oriented with a, a single keel to always be vertical, pointed at the Earth, and using slight gravity gradient effect to have the heavy modules drop down towards the Earth and stabilize that way. Uh, JSC decided to do something similar, but all these truss structures would have to be assembled individually by EVA astronauts. And it looked like it would take a month to assemble. Uh, so the, uh, the Langley folks uh, started, um, really loved the power tower. Um, for years afterwards, the Langley folks would always show um, their favorite space station. Uh, even if we, as we changed it. So, uh, so you can see some of these factors coming in uh, about communication paths and windows, berthing ports for the different vehicles, uh, radiators for the heat, uh, and uh, all these things like that. Uh, ones that, experiments that look up to the sky and experiments that look down to the, to the earth. Uh, one problem with this is that the, because the modules were not at the center um, the microgravity for experiments was not perfect. It was always there was always a settling of the uh, of, you know, slight you know one one thousandth gravity kind of thing. Uh, they they changed the the designs of they moved the modules to the center to get better microgravity. They added two keels, and it became the dual keel station. You can see how the modules uh, are big. They're in this case they're they're larger than, you know, uh, bus, commercial bus sizes. Um, two big U.S. modules, labs, and habitats. Uh, European module, Japanese module is the smallest. Um, and then, uh, as time went on, as they kept redesigning, uh, uh, the U.S. modules kept shrinking, and the European module was still a little long. It shrank again. And the Japanese, which started out the smallest, became the largest model, just because they didn't change their design. <coughs> and there were some really stupid ideas, too. 